Welcome to this episode of Peak Financing Market Watch. We speak with market leaders in commercial real estate and related services who have a close pulse on the current market environment. My name is Anton Madley, co-founder and CEO of Peak Financing. My co-host today is Ferris Musa, one of my fellow board members who is also a principal with Disrupt Equity that actively invests in and manages multifamily properties. We are honored uh, today to welcome uh, George Abreu, uh, who is the CEO of Elevate Commercial Investment Group. George is a full-time multifamily investor with more than 1,700 doors as a GP and over 1,400 doors as an LP. He also owns a construction uh, company. Welcome, George. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, why don't you give us a brief background of you and the LA Commercial Investment Group? Yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you guys for, for having me. Um, I'm excited to be on this episode and, um, you know, to be on this show with, with you guys. Uh, I've known you for a while now, both of you. So as far as my, you know, how I got to this point and um, a little bit of my background, so... I started investing in real estate about 15 years ago, started in single family at first, um, started doing a lot of fix and flips. Um, I really kind of fell in love with the transforming a property, you know, taking these really ugly, um, the uglier the better was what we said back then. Um, and then, you know, turning them around. So. Um, I wanted to scale the fix and flips and that's what kind of led me into opening the construction company. I got burned a, a couple times, um, and decided to bring the construction in house that got us, that worked and it got us to the point of doing maybe 40 to 50, um, single family homes per year. And then, um, started doing smaller multifamily properties to the point where I started doing new development as well. And then about four years ago, I kind of looked back and, and everything I had done to that point was very transactional um, from one deal to the next. And I hadn't really worked on building that cash flow and that passive income. And my family was starting to grow and I just, I felt like that was the direction I needed to take uh, to be able to gain more time. Um, so that's when I started looking into, I was introduced. So I had a, a client on the construction company side that was a syndicator in multifamily. We were doing some renovations for them. And he introduced me into what a syndication was and, and how he purchased that, that property before then, I, I had no idea. You know, I thought you had to come in with millions and millions of dollars to buy these apartments that you couldn't um, pretty much gather other investors together to purchase the property with you. Um, so once I learned that, I mean, I, I became obsessed with it. I, I got well-educated on it and um, started tilting my focus towards large multifamily properties um, now to the point where we're actually closing a deal tomorrow and that'll put us about 2,100 units and um, looking to, to grow quite a bit this year. Yeah, so it sounds like we're, I mean, really, it's the thing I think a lot of people see, right, is, you know, they're doing a business, their day job, right? Whether that's construction or something else, you realize that's a cash business, you're making money, right? But you're not necessarily building wealth. And those are two different things, right? And yes, you can invest the money you make into building wealth, but, you know, you're, you're kind of doing the doing, right, is how I like to say it, unless of working on the business, you're working in the business instead, right? And you, I think you came to the same realization that I really, I did as well, right, which is, you know, it's not scalable, right? And really larger apartments can be bought, right, with a group and you kind of learn what syndication is and you realize it's not about one person bringing $10 million, right? It's about collective bringing $10 million and kind of having that common goal, that common uh, shared interest. Yep, you nailed it. So, and so, so then let me ask this. I mean, so what's been the biggest, you know, surprise, right? Kind of with that transition, that change, right? Biggest surprise, that's, that's a good question. Um, 
And I'm just going to put you on the spot because that's kind of what <laughs> I'm doing, right? so, you know, and, and it just, and maybe here, I'll give you a little more context too, right? Came from the construction world, knew how to do construction, knew other operators, right? Because they were your clients. And, you know, you maybe had this, I want to say this romanticized vision of what syndication is, right? And so now you're doing it, right? And what was kind of didn't really match what you thought? Yes, I'll put it down. Um, you know, one thing I knew coming in, I, I knew it was going to be a lot about relationships and, and um, networking, um, which was very different from what I had done before, at least with the single families. Um, so I wouldn't say it was a surprise, but, but it, it definitely confirmed what I was thinking going into this. Um, so I've, I've had to focus a lot on, on building those relationships and, and networking with others. And it's really a, a team game, like you said, to, to be able to take these down. Um, you know, one thing that maybe was a surprise to me was that I kind of underestimated uh, how much uh, I was gonna have to move my companies around to, to kind of adjust um, and, and move some into the right seats and, um, get rid of a lot of staff, honestly, you know, I, I had to kind of slim it down, um, with the volume of single family we were doing, uh, we, we had a pretty large staff and, um, with doing the multifamily, it's more of a, of having less of a staff, but, but, um, I don't want to say more talented, but um, more more focused on their trade for sure. Yeah, very good. Uh, so so early on, I think you partnered up with a pretty sizable uh, company. Uh, uh, how how did you how did you uh, find each other? Was that through your construction company initially, or was that that you actively sought them out as a potential partner? Um, through, through networking, you know, it goes back to, to networking. Um, you know, I decided I was going to go to pretty much any live event that I could find that had anything to do with multifamily. And, um, through that, I met one of the principals and, and, um, actually I, I take that back. I, I, I knew them already and I saw them again at the event and we kind of, uh, uh, started building back up our relationship there and, and ended up partnering on some deals. Very good. So uh, again, right, uh, your your network is key to everything you do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that's what it is, right, with this business. That's, I think, why we all do this. That's why we're doing these podcasts, right? The people you know is really how you grow this business, right? You figure out who's looking for what, how do you add value, and you continue together, right? And, you know, being a GC is probably a very good piece, right? Because that's something that, not enough people have that expertise, so it's not saturated. And it's a good dynamic into other operators, right? Such as us. I'm not an expert in, in GC, right? We partner with people and they've added value for that piece. And, you know, they've gotten a piece of the pie for that as well. And so I think for those listening, right? Understanding that and realizing this business is not about how do I scratch my own back? It's how do I scratch your back? And in return, you scratch my back. And together, all of our backs are scratched. All right, there's my analogy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always say, you know, find that one aspect in, in multifamily real estate that you're really good at and then bring that to other groups. Um, and like you said, with the construction, you know, that was what I saw right away. A lot of the operators don't have that experience. And yet, you know, I know I can step foot on a property and, and give you a ballpark of what the CapEx is going to be within an hour. Um, so that's, yeah, you know, so focus on what, what you're best at and, and then bring that to other groups. Absolutely. And so let me ask you this. What's been the hardest thing you've seen so far? <laughs> so I asked you earlier what was different than what you expected, but what's been the, the most difficult thing? And you can be candid, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I always say it the way it is, man. Um, you know, the hardest thing has probably been... Um, you know, I don't want to say just asset management because I, I feel like a lot of people already say that. Um, and once you get some good systems in place, it, 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 it does become easier. But um, maybe just, just building out the system, um, sorry, the team, and doing, doing that organically. I, I don't want to 
push and, and, and build too, too much on the team without having the, the deal flow and, and, you know, the work there, obviously. Yeah, and, and, and maybe, and I'll answer that question too, to be fair, right? So the hardest thing from what I've seen as well is just, it's operations, right? And, and you're, you mentioned asset management, but I would actually say just property management, right? And yeah. knowing how to work with property managers effectively and they do their job, right? Because as much as we can model a perfect world, right? It's, it's kind of the, the, the buyer and the, and the asset manager's job to kind of figure out what's realistic as well. Right. And then from that, how do you manage the property manager and, and really the people? Because it's a people's thing. Right. And so, you know, and then finding that fine line between how do you, as an owner or as an asset manager, ensure you have access to the things you need and you can trust them to do their role. Right. While also not micromanaging. Right. And then coming off that. Way. So it's kind of a little bit of a tit for tat. And, you know, ultimately these are multi million dollar businesses run by you know, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars salary people. And it's about how do you, you know, help ensure the business performs, right? While having the right people in place to kind of help complete that. I agree. So, so uh, talking about uh, uh, COVID-19 that has been on uh, everyone's mind over the last uh, almost 12 months by now, uh, so obviously now we are in 2021, uh, 2020 just uh, has, has closed on us. Uh, so how have you experienced uh, 2020? Uh, obviously from a, not just from an owner perspective and from a buying perspective, but also on the construction side, right? Since you bring that additional uh, GC element to the table, uh, can you share with us a little bit how you, have you met all these challenges? Yeah, um, you know, it's been one hurdle after the other. Um, 2020 was, was definitely, I know our team has, has grown a lot um, from it. We, we had to make uh, several adjustments. You know, we, luckily construction was, was deemed an essential um, business. So at no point did we have to close our doors. Um, we did have to implement um, safe practices and, and whatnot. And um, we were able to continue with some projects. We did have some projects get put on hold. And, um, you know, we've asked our, our team members to put on several hats and, and, and really step in and kind of um, get in the weeds with us. And you know, luckily they have. Um, and now we're coming into 2021, really in a better spot than we were before. And with a massive pipeline starting to build up of, of projects that need to get done, as well as um, we're starting to get a lot more opportunities as far as uh, acquiring properties. Um, you know, 2021 is starting to look like it's gonna be pretty, pretty crazy year. No, absolutely. And maybe let me ask you this. I mean, what have you been seeing with the deal flow kind of thing, right? In terms of what brokers are whispering and where you're shaking out and are they aligned or things kind of getting heated or not? No, I have my answer, but I want to see what you're thinking. Oh, I, I know what your answer is. <laughs> but um, look, the the pricing is, is, is tough out there. It's, it's rough. Their um, cap rates continue to get compressed from what I've seen and, and Prices are going up. Um, the, the good thing I've seen is that uh, lenders obviously are still being very aggressive and, and, and offering great terms, um, as well as the bridge loans have come back into play. And, and um, I've been able to spot opportunities more on deals that would require a bridge loan, you know, un, un, unstabilized deal. Um, a deal right now that's cash flowing day one. Um, some of those prices, man, are just tough. No, absolutely right. And I think you mentioned something about lending, right? And, and lenders are, you know, unfortunately, it's kind of a fluid market, right? And I see people that model deals really aggressively, right? Hoping they're going to get the best debt in the world. And 
you know, ultimately once it comes down to the chopping block, right, that doesn't happen. And so, you know, you're seeing people get into these deals and, you know, they're significantly off. And I got an email this morning actually from a group that's trying to close on a deal. They're short because the debt can't so short and they're trying to close that last bit of the, you know, the rest of the, the, the raise in the GP. And so, yeah, I mean, it's important, I think, to kind of be wary of what the pulse on the market is and kind of what's going on. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so it's it's interesting uh, to, to see that, and we certainly have seen it much more over the last uh, nine months or so, where deal, deals came back, and it's less because the property was not performing, right? That was typically the case when collections dropped and all that, and they had to retrade, and then the buyer walked away. Now we see more and more where the property still kind of was performing along the same levels, but the buying group somehow <coughs> misjudged uh, the, the capital stack, and uh, whether it was the cost of debt, whether it was the cost of equity, uh, you name it, and they've uh, essentially decided to, to walk away from uh, from some of these deals. So it's it's only very interesting to see. And George, you also mentioned right when it's a cash flowing stabilized asset, it's not really a surprise because the financing there obviously is the easiest to get thanks to agency financing, and everyone loves that, right? Whereas on the bridge side, while the bridge uh, loans have come back it is really more for the established players where it's still readily available, right? If you just start out, uh, it's much harder for your group. Obviously, it's easier to get to get breach financing in place, uh, but it still needs to be the right asset and the right market. Uh, whereas on the agency side, it's just uh, almost a free for all. As long as the property underwrites, you can get that financing in place, right? Yeah, yeah, no, they've they definitely become more strict too. Um, just even in the paperwork they're asking for on the front end. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. I totally agree as well. Yeah. And, and so I guess so, you know, with that said, right, wrapping up, I mean, I'd love to hear both you and Anton in terms of just what you think, you know, now the new administration is coming into, you know, control, right? what are y'all's kind of perceptions into what the future holds and i'll give you mine as well but you know let's start with you anton i want to kind of hear your uh unbiased swiss banker mentality <laughs> to what the future holds yeah that, for those uh, listening don't make any big important life decisions on anything that three of us are going to say right just yeah. all predictions that proverbial crystal ball right uh, I, th I think with the uh, biden and administration we will see a massive amount of money that is being tossed uh, at us and uh, that will have definitely a positive impact from my perspective on the economy and it definitely also has a has a positive impact on on assets uh, because there is it's just so much growth and pent-up demand that particularly once the vaccinations come through, I think in the second half of this year, assuming that all, all that works out, and I anticipate it's going to work out, uh, that we will see a, a strong growth that comes into play. On the flip side, though, with that, I think in the first half of this year, we, we will probably get through a pre some pretty tough periods of times. But I think that's the good opportunity to buy assets one still can buy. And the financing is likely also at the point where it's the most attractive for some time to come, right? So I know a lot of people feel that interest rates will stay low and we, we potentially will get even lower. I personally do not believe that that is going to be the case because with that growth that I foresee it's going to come, uh, interest rates will move up because we have that infl inflationary pressure in place. So I think the first half of this year is uh, likely a great opportunity to buy and get financing at very reasonable cost into play, uh, into place. And even if you all already own assets, that's probably a good time also to refinance. Yeah. And, and maybe I'll add my opinion then and for her, I'll let you kind of <laughs> give yours and wrap up. But, you know, I, I agree with you, Anton. I disagree with the, with the time. Window, right. I, I think ultimately the thing that, that your statement is ignoring is 
that there's because of more money pumped into the market, right? More spending, more everything. There's a lot more, you know, money that's going to trickle up and that money's going to look to invest into something, right? And, you know, ultimately there's very few better yielding things than real estate, right? And, you know, multifamily kind of was the, was the, what's the word, was the doll, right? Through COVID, right? I mean, yes, there's delinquency. Yes, some better than others, but ultimately, you know, it was resilient, right? It did okay, right? Versus things like office or hospitality got completely crushed. And so I think, you know, money is recognizing that. And I think ultimately they're going to move more money into multifamily. That's kind of my big prediction, right? And looking for yielding plays. And so I actually think cap rates will compress probably throughout the rest of the year. And maybe, you know, from there, we'll see what happens. But I think it's, you know, I think your timeline is a little bit too tight for me, right? So I think it's kind of, it's a little bit longer before we really start to see, you know, inflation impact interest rates and, you know, pricing. Yeah. Uh, well, that's that's the, the whole purpose of this discussion, uh -huh. right? to agree, yeah. to disagree. And again, let's look back in a year and see where... <laughs> well, don't worry, I already set a reminder to call you know, to tell Anton he was wrong a year from now. Right? <laughs> so I'm going to go with the safe bet and I'm going to say I agree with both of you. No. <laughs> um, I do agree this, this quarter may have some opportunities pop up, depending on how quick things happen and how quick... Um, you know, obviously they've already approved this, this one bill, um, but how quick does that money kind of get out there? Um, if it gets out there pretty quick, then, then I agree with, with Ferris that there's, you know, it's going to continue to get compressed, the cap rates and, and pricing is going to continue to go up. Um, I think this year, like I said, it's going to be a hot market this year. I mean, it's, um, like Ferris said, money is going to continue to roll into multifamily even more than before. They're going to be leaving other spaces and coming into multifamily. Um, my thing is, what's going to happen when the economy is back full force? And like you, like you mentioned, Anton, that the interest rates are most likely going to go up at that point. Um, you know, then what happens? And and what happens to the market and the real estate cycle and how much of a dip are we going to take um that stuff i just don't know but yeah. this year's looking good yeah very good so uh, uh, that's the big question mark right once uh, once rates move up and again i believe they will move up uh but i think there is still quite a bit of uh, space there for for cap rates to stay the same, particularly in, in desirable uh, asset classes, right? For for some like retail and offices, uh, they might well move up. And hospitality, obviously, they have it's hard even to come up with a with a true cap rate for hospitality assets. But when it comes to very desirable assets like multifamily. There is only an opportunity for interest rates to move up and the cap rate still stay stable, right? Because the delta is right now is still uh, pretty big and historically that still could shrink without have putting, uh, from a historical perspective, at least put pressure on, on the multifamily cap rates, right? But uh, again, we just do not know, right? I think as long as multifamily performs really well, uh, I see that there is uh, a more of a shift from some of these commercial real estate asset class like offices and retail by institutional players too towards multifamily, uh, which uh, I think, and there I agree with Ferris that the, the cap rates will, will stay at the, at the very attractive level compared to to some of the, the, the other asset classes. At the same time, I still feel that uh, there will be some uh, opportunities uh, the, in the first half, uh, plainly because some operators are not as good as others. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I think that's where really the the good buyers and uh, the not so good buyers really make a difference. Right? That you first are able to identify the opportunities, but also have the right partners and capital in place that you can take advantage of those. And that brings me back to that bridge loan discussion we have had before, right, with George, 
that not everyone can take advantage of these opportunities because they don't have the experience and they don't have the, the backing that is really needed to get these deals done. Yeah. What are you guys' uh, thoughts on converting office or hotels into multifamily? I like the idea. I think it's not as cheap as some people know, but hey, you know what? I happen to know a contractor in a GC that probably knows a thing or two about what it takes. And so I think it's conceptually, it's great. I think it only works in certain areas and certain parts of town, right? Like, you know, I'm in Houston, I'm in the energy corridor. Does it really make sense? Like, do people want to do that kind of conversion, right? You really have to target a higher end finish, right? Because you're already dropping all the money to begin with. And so, does someone want to live in a higher end? quasi high rise in the energy corridor of Houston? Maybe not. I don't think so, right? But if you're in downtown Houston or downtown name your city, right, it probably makes a lot more sense. And so I like the idea. I know someone that's doing it. I'm kind of wanting to sit back and see how that one pans out. But I mean, conceptually, I, I like the idea a lot, right? I think the most money you can make in real estate is where you buy something at one cap, right, based on one asset class and you convert it to something else. And now you're just getting that immediate cap compression. Yeah, I, I personally feel the opportunities definitely are there. Uh, I foresee that it particularly is very valuable uh, in in the workforce housing space, right? Uh, we, it's extremely difficult, as you know, George, to build affordable housing at, at prices that make sense to offer affordable rents. And particularly offices, I'm not so sure because the construction costs, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the rehab costs there would be pretty significant. And I'm not sure that that would make sense unless you go into a class A environment. But for to convert particularly extended stay hotels uh, in some markets where, where there is a need for workforce housing, I think that that's really a niche where, where I've, I believe there is a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, yeah no, the construction cost is definitely a lot less on the hotels. I mean, you've got the plumbing and a lot of the layout kind of there already with office. Yeah, you're talking about a lot of uh, running a lot of MEPs. Yeah. yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Right. Very good. So, uh, uh, George, do you have anything else that you would like to share with us uh, before we wrap it up? Kind of an uh, interesting okay. snippet. Yeah, I've got one more I can throw out there. Um, <laughs> so how about with, with some of this pricing, especially in the, the Class C getting so high um, in specific markets like Dallas and Houston maybe is not that high yet, but... Um, Comparing that to new construction, like some of these class C's in certain areas are getting close to what I can build something for. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've, I've, I completely agree. Right, I'm puzzled, particularly in DFW, right, where we see some of these uh, C class uh, prices that are being paid. Uh, that are at or actually above of uh, of a of a new construction, right? Mm -hmm. For even even if it's a bare bone construction, right? And we really need to compare it not with a class A building, but with a bare bones, let's say B minus construction, and that uh, that is really puzzling me. Uh, what what some of these uh, buyers are are paying. Uh, uh, but again, right? Uh, so I th it's it's hard to tell why, and it's also uh, it's similar to California, I would say, where we where a lot of buyers have experienced these price appreciations, and obviously their replacement cost is not even an issue there. It's everyone thinks just about appreciation, and I'm wondering whether a lot of these buyers uh, hope for that appreciation play going forward. Uh, uh, from my perspective, it's pretty risky, but obviously there are buyers out there that are willing to take that risk. Yeah, that's a good um, comparison there because in, in California, the only way you can really make money is developing at this point um, yeah. versus buying an existing. And then you see markets like Atlanta where that's shifting, right? You see groups that are now starting to buy deals at 140, 150 a door for, you know, 70s, 80s products. They're putting 30, 40 a door into it. Right. So they're doing pretty extensive rehabs. And the argument is, well, your cost basis ends up being 180, 190, but you're getting the same rents the guy that's paying 230 
you know, a unit is getting, right? But I'm like, well, yeah, the 230 unit is also like 40 years newer, right? 230 years. And so it's just, I'm a big believer in needs to be risk adjusted returns, right? Not just returns for the sake of returns. And so, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see kind of where things go. And then really where where, where the market shifts. Like I, I'm borderline feeling like I'm gonna be priced out of Atlanta here. So, you know, we'll see where else is next. <laughs> Me personally, I'm, I'm jumping on the new development. I mean, we've got quite a bit of them going on and looking at more. I just think it's just the way the prices are raising on the C class. It's really opening the door to just doing the new construction. Yes, and obviously you you have that that background that helps, right? And as long as you partner up with the right development partners, uh, uh, I think it's it's the right thing to do. Uh, a lot of people, I think, underestimate the complexity of, of ground-up development, though, right? Yeah, so, a, lot of, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And also the timing, right? The timeline just to get everything entitled and then actually get to a shovel-ready project uh, can be can be quite extensive. And depending on what city you're in, uh, you may think you're ready in six months and 18 months later, you're still struggling and uh fighting with city council or zoning or whoever it might be yeah yeah no totally agree yeah very good uh so ferris do you have anything anything else we'd like to add uh, that's all i got just really yeah. horny how can people get a hold of you um we've got a bunch of information on our website elevatecig.com um they can also shoot me an email if they'd like George or Jorge, J-O-R-G-E at ElevateCIG.com. Very good. Uh, so it's very easy to find George right on social or media. Social media yeah. <laughs> so I don't think uh, it's, it will be hard for, for any of you to find him. Uh, so thanks again very much, uh, George, for, for joining us today. You added some some great snippets and uh we wish you all the best for 2021 i'm i'm sure it will be a great success for you and your your partners and uh we look forward to to hear from you again soon uh, to on the progress you're making thank you same to you guys yeah no problem. thanks a lot Harry. appreciate thanks it so much.